Bonjour, bonjour à vous tous. So, good afternoon to all of you. Thank you uh, for being with us. Uh, we have uh, great panelists. It's very hot. It's not easy uh, to endure the uh, hot weather. We have some fans, so you can get a bit of fresh air. The new sectors uh, to produce tomorrow, it's a key topic with lots of challenges. Before getting down to the nitty gritty of a topic, allow me to make a couple of words. I'd like uh, to uh, say hello to Jean Pisani Ferry. He's not with us today. And uh, I would like to say hello to him. I'm proud of uh, moderating this uh, uh, panel with uh, relevant, prominent, competent people. But I have an issue when there is no gender balance on uh, the uh, panel. So, uh, so I, I can keep a low profile, especially when there are no women on stage. So pandemic. Uh, decarbonization, uh, deglobalization, these are three main structural trends, uh, three main underlying uh, trends and transformations, shocks, I would say. And the economic systems are being redesigned, they are being rejigged, and the labor market is being transformed, and we need to adapt very quickly. So there's a specific feature with uh, today's society, a fast, transformations, uh, we are almost doomed to accept these faster transformations. So we have to change very swiftly. These three main changes, they change to the way we relate to the work, the geography of industrial sites. It's imperative to have a carbon-free economy, and this has an impact on different sectors. What kind of industrial landscape I will introduce the a different uh, guests today, the different panelists who are with us. We'll have a look at the different dimensions. First, Jacques Aschen, Aschen Broge, he worked with uh, Syncoba, uh, Valeo. You were the CEO of Valeo for six uh, years, 400,000 employees. You've secured a foothold in 30 countries in the world, lots of Valeo sensors in the world, a big partner uh, of all automotive manufacturers. And this is one of the uh, companies with the highest number of uh, sensors. And um, your company uh, highlights the transformation of uh, today's world. Next to him, Nicolas Dubourg uh, is our gestion manager, a uh, strategic company in uh, long-term assets. You are well positioned to inform us about industrial projects, relocation projects, how we uh, create not industrial champions, but rather coalitions in order to uh, get champions and focus on innovations. Next to him. Ming Pokei, the F CEO of uh, Cathay Capital. Uh, so Ming Po uh, uh, arrived in France when he was uh, 20 years of age in Orléans. He is at the head of one of the major capital investment companies created for entrepreneurs. Uh, to entrepreneurs. What is important is the cross-border approach. How can we work with industrial alliances, regional alliances, in order to be able to perform and uh, invent uh, the uh, future? Next to him, so we have someone from Tunisia. We are very fortunate, Fatma Marakshi Chanfi. So you've just arrived from Tunisia. Thank you for being with us. You are a professor of economics at the uh, Tunis University. So you are in charge of the International Economic Integration Laboratory, specializing in cooperation. Uh, you have lots of skills, lots of uh, competencies. You understand uh, the international market markets rationale, 300 million young people will arrive on the labor market in the MENA region, so these uh, people uh, should be able to work in some uh, sectors uh, that uh, will create jobs, so they have to be trained in a relevant uh, fashion. The last guest.
Kevin, you are Kevin, uh, sorry. Kevin is uh, the CEO of the camp with the holding company E to cover uh, the camp, uh, the innovation campus of X. It's uh, an interesting innovation place. It's uh, an experience and an experiment as well. So I talked to you a little bit earlier. You told me uh, I like uh, these uh, panels, but I hope that they would be tangible and concrete measures. Of course, we're going to spend a good moment together. We will moot uh, ideas, but we want uh, tangible things, uh, tangible outcomes. Uh, in order to uh, focus on energy. What is important is uh, to build uh, the uh, future industrial sectors. So, so the uh, different panelists will have five or six minutes to elaborate on an idea. Jacques Aschenbrough uh, told me that he wanted to speak freely and we can rely on him. He's a major industrialist. He has some unprecedented experience in the field of transformation we know that France has lost one third of uh, industrial jobs. There was a, an economic tragedy, and Nicolas Dufour wrote a very poignant book. It's a collective responsibility. The industrial industry, the industrial uh, sector has almost disappeared in France, and we can understand the extent of the damage. And we need to build, to build uh, industrial sovereignty. Uh, industrial jobs, uh, industrial skills, competencies, industrial comp uh, cooperation. Jacques, you have the floor. So I worked for Valeo for uh, 13 years, not six years. Oh, sorry about that. We have to be humble when it comes uh, to making an assessment. I'm not going to answer the question in which sectors we need to invest, but I would rather revisit the uh, different uh, topics uh, that have grabbed the headlines, uh, that have grabbed the political economic headlines at the Ecole des Mides. Uh, we were talking about, about uh, nodules, semiconductors, uh, nanoparticles. Now we are talking about uh, uh, we're talking about the Internet of Things, hydrogen. But what about these uh, topics, issues? Are these uh, uh, full-fledged uh, topics or not? I mean, in the past, I mean, we focused on some uh, issues, but uh, these were not forthcoming. I'm under the impression that we're beating about the bush. So if uh, Benoit Potier, the uh, CEO of Air Liquid, would listen to me, he would uh, be uh, crying foul. So uh, in the meantime, we haven't seen uh, the smartphones uh, coming. Uh, um, Amazon, we haven't seen Apple. Uh, specify coming. So when we uh, cast a future-oriented eye, most of the time we are wrong. And uh, you talked about uh, 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 in-depth transformation of Valeo. So 13 uh, years after, we are the leader in uh, electric cars, and we are the leader in uh, driving assistance uh, models. Uh, you have some sensors uh, being fitted to a car, being the ears and eyes of a car. But uh, 13 years before, we thought that uh, there were some trends emerging in the field of electricity. We have the golden nugget, the uh, stop and start system that we developed with Peugeot. Basically, when uh, you stop at a, uh, uh, when you stop, basically the uh, engine. Uh, switched off. So when we uh, presented this uh, new innovation, people said, that's not great. Uh, diesel is better. It's a better invention. So you, we stop and start. Uh, mechanism was not really popular. And uh, remember, uh, then there was uh, the diesel gate. And uh, all of a sudden, uh, our innovation was uh, popular. So uh, we created a JV with Siemens on uh, 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 low voltage. So we are the leader in the electric car uh, industry. And at that time, uh, 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 10 years ago, rather, uh, people didn't talk about uh, electric cars. Uh, of course, CO2 emissions uh, was uh, the uh, topic of the day. This was our motto at uh, Valeo. But uh, today, people want to ban 
uh, thermal uh, vehicles, uh, internal combustion engine powered vehicles. So it's very difficult I mean, to anticipate. We have to be ready when the market is, uh, is there. Why France can or can't be at the forefront of industrialization. This is something that is necessary. So routes are important. In the SBF 100, in the CAC 40, we have global leaders, global businesses with French roots, and they can expand throughout the world. And it's a great asset for France. But there are four uh, dimensions that we need to consider. If we want to get a solid industrial base in France, we need to have entrepreneurs. If you want to transform the French society, uh, 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 we need to have entrepreneurs. We have lots of civil servants, and uh, now we have entrepreneurs. We have uh, 25 unicorns, and we can be very proud of this in-depth transformation, the ability to create from scratch uh, companies or businesses, a unicorn a company i.e. virtual or actual uh, capitalization of one billion dollars. I mean, these unicorns didn't exist 10 years ago, and we have uh, 24 unicorns or so, so we can be very proud of that. Then a science, uh, basic uh, science is key in uh, laboratories, public and private uh, laboratories. You have applied R&D at value. Uh, uh, we devoted 12% uh, of our earnings to R&D, and uh, the uh, stock market price was affected at Valio. We developed lots of technological platforms, the best in the world, and I can uh, tell you that it's a good bedrock if you want to start. So uh, science entrepreneurs are key. Uh, allow me to interrupt you. So to do what you've achieved. So you uh, gambled on R&D. So you uh, developed some platforms with a scientific background. But did you get the right people, the right uh, skilled people? Do we have enough uh, gray matter in order to solidify the R&D departments at Valeo? Of course, yes. Uh, of course, uh, we have 50% uh, of research in France, and in France we managed to fetch uh, uh, skilled uh, people in terms of soft mechatronics. Of course, uh, we are equipped with those uh, uh, skill skills, and uh, these uh, techno technological assets should uh, be beefed up. So, of course, uh, we need to teach math maths uh, more uh, at schools, but we need to. Uh, uh, in increase the relevance of sciences and maths in schools and universities. Uh, today, it's a little bit more difficult because the turnover is high. But back to the entrepreneurs and uh, science entrepreneurs, uh, of course, we have lots of science entrepreneurs uh, in the world. What is important is to get a financial ecosystem in order to support uh, these uh, changes. And there's another a uh, topic that is important, stop to bureaucracy. Uh, so in our country, there's too much, red, too much red tape. I mean, we have lots of regulations. Even when the uh, companies are not in a position to comply with these regulations, production costs have never been so high in the world. Uh, I mean, I'm talking about our, our, our costs. I mean, uh, payroll taxes are too high. Uh, wage costs are too high in France. But of course, we have to be humble. We need to work on the ecosystem that will enable those uh, sectors uh, to emerge. So there is no inexorable uh, trend. So France uh, can be reindustrialized if we can work on the four points that you've mentioned. Yes, there is no doubt about it. But uh, these are uh, uh, issues, I mean, they should be dealt with. Uh, collectively, you have great uh, companies, great businesses, uh, uh, fantastic, outstanding entrepreneurs, business leaders, but they need to stay in France. Uh, and of course, uh, the uh, French base uh, and the international base should be furthered. Uh, I, I talk uh, with the different uh, business leaders in France, and they are well aware that the French roots are uh, pivotal in terms of growth 
and very few uh, uh, people think that if you are not a French company, uh, you cannot develop. That's not true. So, Nicolas from Isalt, you've been invested in uh, French companies, in uh, small companies, uh, industrial technological companies. Nicolas, for you, in order to develop new industrial sectors, in order to relocate industrial activities in France, do you think that we have the financial ecosystem? So you support innovative industrial projects. So what is the outlook? What are the difficulties that you're contending with in order to move up to, to, to scale and to make sure that things are tangible? Uh, thank you, uh, Vincent, for these uh, uh, questions. I will uh, uh, give you some answers. And I will be humble, as uh, Jacques uh, said. So I will uh, say a few words about ESALT and uh, our approach. And uh, you will uh, notice that uh, I'm in line with the previous uh, speaker in terms of what needs to be implemented to reindustrialize the country. So ESALT, so we have a purpose, a long-term investment in French companies, in French capital companies who are supported by seven insurance companies in France. And there are some representatives in the room, and I like to say hello to them. So the idea is to provide stable capital uh, to the long-term uh, uh, shareholders. It's important to have long-term uh, shareholders and to have solid roots. So, we are a shareholder of Valeo. We've invested in a technological company, but uh, we invested in a semiconductor a company, Soltech. And uh, it's a high added value business, and they invest hundreds of millions of euros uh, in Grenoble. Uh, uh, plants and factories, and there is uh, some uh, public uh, assistance. And this is something that we need to, ta to take into account. I'm over to echo what has been said earlier. As far as I'm concerned, in France, uh, there's a good momentum in terms of industrial projects. Very positive momentum as a financier, as investor. This is something that uh, we look at very closely. Today's uh, uh, industry is no longer taboo. I concur with Jacques. He talked about uh, unicorns. Uh, these are uh, digital technological unicorns. But in France, it would be a good idea to have industrial companies that uh, could be created providing benefits. What are we talking about? Energy, carbon-free energy, technology, health, food industry, agri-food industries. So in terms of investments, there are some projects in those fields. Those projects are not all mature, but uh, these projects are being implemented in France, and they are spearheaded by entrepreneurs, by business leaders. That's an interesting trend. And I talked about that this morning. Elon Musk uh, did a lot uh, for the industry. When I consider the mindset, he has unleashed uh, 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 new patterns. So when you are an industrialist, you have to take risks. And when you take risks, uh, uh, you can have some industrial developments through innovation, technology, and decarbonization. Why is it a positive? Why is it good? Because there's an ambition to do something important and to provide uh, solutions to our uh, issues uh, connected with a transition, a topic that we touched upon repeatedly at X. So if you consider the creation of uh, companies, uh, there's a, a, some, a sim symbiotic uh, relationship in terms of energy sourcing, in terms of uh, energy recycling, uh, in terms of uh, finished products, in terms of partnerships. You have lots of industrialists who are bigger, and we are liaising with the academic world and the research world. So these are 
laboratories that are pivotal. Last point, in the field of uh, decarbonization, there are lots of projects that are being established. What do we need? In the long haul, we need industrial successes in France in order to set in motion a new movement. We need different uh, dimensions, facilities, infrastructures. There should be local companies, local factories. When I discuss with the business leaders and entrepreneurs, uh, things are uh, much easier than in the past, though the uh, process is protracted, but uh, people are no longer afraid of industry. We need uh, a skilled people. That's not easy uh, to get a skilled people. This is the main concern of these industrialists. You need funding for the industry. Long-term funding is necessary. So it means that we need to uh, ponder over the uh, funding of uh, developments. Nicolas Dubourg. Traditionally in economy, we uh, know that we need the human capital, uh, and if I understand well, there was a, sort of like something that triggered uh, things in terms of the mentality, something changed, something happened. Uh, it's easier today. Maybe there's a new generation of entrepreneurs for whom industry is a future and a perspective, the immediate perspective of decar decarbonization which uh, encourages to uh, increase performances on that aspect. And would you say that in your field the capital is available, that you can accompany projects, that enterprises can find money insofar as there is a project, uh, innovative project, um, possibility for uh, localization, something that is uh, deserves investment and is worthwhile to invest in? Well, it's a fairly recent phenomenon. I would say it's not. I wouldn't say that everything is um, is solved. Or um, uh, what we see, and I think that's interesting. In France, there's a new the recovery plan for by the, uh, at the horizon of 2030 with the very well targeted topics. Uh, and when you fit in with it, with this framework, you can get subsidies in terms of uh, capital, in terms of the funding to develop your industry, and it helps to uh, take the, the industrial risk. It's important to have these mechanisms available. Second point, which in my opinion will facilitate investments in time, several of these projects uh, are based on the fact that productions are pre-sold, and once they are ready, they are uh, purchased by great order givers, and they correspond to the uh, to needs for final products. Where they're manufactured under certain standards, uh, they comply with uh, the expectations of the final consumers, and so they enable to lift the risks. It's a bit like infrastructure, for example, in which you know that behind it, the, the people who will use this infrastructure. So there are elements today that. Uh, in time, I'm sure, will uh, help finding financing, but we'll have to be bold more than we are today. Um, I would say that for those who want to ask questions, uh, don't hesitate. You know, and for those who wa who are watching this uh, remotely uh, on the uh, Hong Kong website, I will uh, transmit your questions to our guests. Uh, so the floor is now to Min Cap. I said that you arrived in France in Orléans at the age of 20. You uh, created an investment capital uh, company, big company. And what can we do on the transborder uh, activities uh, uh, or uh, form alliances that transform national realities through uh, 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 logic of investment and innovation? How do you see? This perspective. Do you also believe that in France we can find new sectors, uh, industrial sectors, uh, when you consider the challenges we're faced with, like decarbonization, energy topics, and mobility uh, aspects? Are these sectors where in France, in your opinion, we can find projects, develop these projects, and, and uh, rebuild an uh, industrial activity? Thank you. Vincent. My answer is yes. Uh, before talking about new sectors, I think that uh, geographically 
speaking, France is a, a good place to produce. Uh, I'm, for example, I'm Chinese, and uh, the, the French soil is so fertile that even China, uh, we create a Chinese created a company, it's Cathay Capital. So the soil is very, the land is very fertile here. And uh, I'd like to pay a tribute to Jacques, first of all, because when I started seven years ago here in Cathay Innovation, it's the first French industrialist who. Uh, places trust in us, and he uh, believed that uh, at the border of borders, or uh, we can innovate. And for innovation, if you talk about uh, sectors, uh, there's no need to insist on new or old sectors. Uh, there's a, not a new world and a, an old world. Uh, I think that with uh, existing industries, we can also find uh, new ideas, new. A project. So, what are the unsatisfied sectors to which the industry can respond? Uh, thanks to the digitalization, we can know precisely what people are expecting, what the consumer is expecting. So, in innovation, there are two ideas. You know, either uh, 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 technological uh, breaking. I think that breakthrough. I think that. Uh, uh, for example, innovation in the economic field can be immediate or it can eventually have an immediate effect. But on technology, a rupture, well, uh, it takes time. And, and you, need, you need the basis. I think France has an advantage compared to any other country is that you have a training system a uh, high-quality training system, educational system. And I was saying that, contrary to what you can think, I think it's a, a country that's uh, highly tolerant, very open. Look at the, the proof. You accept me to be here. <laughs> so you have to be very open-minded. So anyway, uh, I was talking about and I, uh, the borders of borders. I think an innovation can come at the border, at the limit of different sectors uh, and uh, in different geographies. And the second topic I wanted to highlight is that maybe we, we need to stop to distinguish, to make distinctions uh, with borders. You know, uh, the French, you know, the French can produce in France, the Americans uh, can produce in France, and the Chinese can also produce in France. So the idea is how can you um, how can you be smart enough in so far as, for, for example, I'll take an example. Today we talk about energy, for new energies, and for example, the production of batteries or solar panels. Of course, you, with the money you have, you can uh, build a plant uh, in Orléans, for example. I'm a, a Chinese in Orléans myself. But the question is, there's a lot of know-how uh, on solar panels, and notably in China, there is a lot of know-how. But you can think, okay, we will disrupt, we will break the bridges. But sometimes you need to understand that the supply chain cannot be generated instantaneously. You can't just say, okay, I'll transfer everything here or there. No, you have to be serious. You always have to stay open, open-minded, and tolerant, and accept. And that's what you did again. Uh, to foreigners to come here to create their own uh, their companies, but some com uh, some countries must accept the same. Uh, I uh, support the reciprocity, and I uh, advocate that uh, uh, you know building bridges, uh, geopolicies is trying to build bridges, but sometimes a link of confidence, trust is developed with time. It's like a tunnel. It's very efficient. It uh, resists, and what that's what Cathay did uh, uh, with 1,300 people, nine offices, and uh, we help uh, entrepreneurs to be very Americans in the U.S., very Chinese in China, and of course other companies uh, that come to France. Well, we contribute to make them French. So I think it's a recipe to find the right sectors, um, uh, so that we uh, show the way for tomorrow. But we feel like. Having faith in what you're saying, to to uh, to accept what you're saying, and open in openness, uh, capacity to get along, um, and, uh, and invest on uh, projects without taking into consideration borders or limits. But aren't we in a period where it's the opposite that's taking place? We have uh, 
uh, will to uh, recover the national sovereignties or the regional sovereignties. And we see that um, we were subject to a lot of uh, difficulties through the pandemic, uh, through the issue of energy today. And we see that each region today is trying to play its own card, to develop its assets, uh, but to work firstly at the regional rather than at the international level. If, you're, if you think of the first global globalization model, the real internalize, internalization uh, goes through the localization. The localization uh, wants to be have a certain perennity, well, it has to be international. I uh, very good to grow tomatoes. A shock maybe is better for. Uh, for uh, zucchinis, uh, uh, but we can't eat uh, tomatoes and zucchini, can, the tomatoes every day. Sometimes I need zucchinis. So instead, instead of making barriers between all the gardens, I prefer to lift the barriers and trade with Jacques. So maybe I'm going to change jobs and produce the zucchinis. Now we're meant to work together. Uh, humanly speaking, uh, we can't uh, break the links. You know, it's, uh, it doesn't work. But there's uh, geopolitics, and sometimes things are complicated. But we uh, like your metaphor, you know, uh, uh, with the, the tomatoes and zucchinis. We like that here. Fatma Maragzi, you are uh, come from Tunisia. You are the director of the International Integration Laboratory, uh, interested in uh, comparative advantage, but you're also interested, you notably, in the region you live in, and that will uh, tomorrow uh, see uh, hundreds of thousands of young people who will uh, arrive on the labor market that you'll have to accompany, try to orient towards uh, uh, employment sectors and uh, competencies that uh, take up the challenges to which we're facing. How do you, what do you think of our uh, idea of uh, industrial relocalization as seen from the other shore of the Mediterranean in a country that's dear to us, Tunisia. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your question. In fact, when you look at the title of this session, I thought that it would be a bit too ambitious, new sectors to produce tomorrow. Well, I don't know if I can uh, answer this question, but at least I'll try to propose some uh, tracks for reflection uh, in the sense that uh, I'm very sensitive to the international economy. It's a sector in which uh, I, I operate, I work. Uh, we always uh, learn and we teach our students that this issue of specialization that is uh, redundant, in fact, uh, and it's been the case in all times, uh, a country where, what sector will it specialize? And the question is yet uh, very urgent today with the crisis that we're going through. Um, in fact, we teach our students to, to do things simply. One of the basic theories that is uh, comparative advantages uh, well, tells us that it's better for each country to specialize in those sectors where it is the most competent, when, uh, where it's the cheapest to produce. And so I make reference to the comparative, uh, the revealed comparative advantage, which is a ratio that enables to calculate for a given sector your performance level with, compared to your sector in your country with relation to the performance in another region of the world or the world itself. If you do better than in the rest of the world, then you should specialize in this sector. However, today we are faced with crisis that we all know, the COVID crisis, for example, the pandemic, and also the world that broke through in Ukraine. And I think that everybody here agrees to say that we can no longer afford to stay confined in this comparative advantage theory because today, in fact, countries are trying to improve their resilience with a view to the shocks, uh, the shocks that we don't know. We know the recent ones, but we don't know what tomorrow is made of. As uh, uh, the Prime Minister of France just uh, said a few uh, hours ago, we don't know what shocks we'll have to face tomorrow uh, to, to get prepared today. Uh, uh, however, we need to um, work on what we already know. We need to uh, focus on that and uh, 
in response to your question, for the region I know and the region I come from, uh, which is the MENA region, Middle East and North Africa, uh, where by 2050 we'll have something like 300 million uh, young workers who will arrive on the labor market. What will we offer them? You said 300 million? Colossal, enormous, gigantic. And we have to really give a lot of thought on that, uh, even we're a little late. And so uh, following these two recent crisis, the world, what did the world need? In fact, we needed uh, sanitation, sanitary uh, uh, help. Uh, we needed uh, digitalization, uh, IT, so that we continue to work, uh, the platforms. Uh, two sectors came out of that, the health sector and the digitalization sector. Uh, there's another imperative that should be added to this that is following the climate change that we are experiencing. It's renewables, it's ecology, green energies on which we need to work without any further delay. And it's a sector that's very important, as important at the ethics. Oh, the, the, the uh, the uh, computer, uh, the, the new sectors, uh, digitalization sector, for example, computer sectors. We can also talk about circular economy, uh, information technology, and so on. But to prepare all this, we need to give some thought on the, the sector of education. How should we prepare the educational sector, whether public or private? How? What do we do? To, to better train these people, the young people, to, to educate them and to ensure the vocational training so that those young people are always uh, updated to face the shocks, whether negative or positive. Unfortunately, what we went through in the recent years are negative shocks that were uh, felt by, uh, by all. And so that's at the level of services. We can also uh, talk about those sectors, uh, good producing sectors. What goods will we produce from now on? Uh, we know as of today that what we're producing for the international market is uh, it's not a standard exchange selling raw material to uh, uh, get uh, finished products. Today, uh, international trade is done uh, based on international value chains. Each country will uh, produce a bit, a little part of something, like a, a part of a plane, part of a computer, part of a mobile phone, and they're all assembled somewhere else where it's the cheapest to do that task. We saw that during the COVID crisis and also uh, with the Ukraine war, we saw that this creates a lot of vulnerability for countries uh, at large, for the MENA region and for Tunisia in a more specific manner. So instead of uh, uh, answering to the, the question of what are the sectors of t tomorrow, I would say how we gain in agility to increase the resilience of these countries so they are able to face any shock, whether it's negative or positive for these countries. So producing according to these uh, international value chains gives rise to a lot of vulnerability. We should be capable today of facing these vulnerabilities through a better agility, uh, focusing on the sector of education. Thank you. La Santé. So you've, you've talked about uh, health, impious uh, topics, health, uh, digital technologies, these are resilience uh, factors. Uh, Kevin Polizzi, when I introduced uh, you, I said that you are the CEO of Unitel. You've just uh, taken over the, the, the campus, and uh, we are back in Aix-en-Provence because you have been at the helm of the uh, uh, innovation campus of Aix-en-Provence. So, uh, from regional to ultra-local, it's a place of innovation. It's a tangible experience and experiment. When you are a place for innovation, how can we marshal skills, competencies, capital, ideas, technologies? The objective is to get concrete reindustrialization projects. Hello, everyone. Delighted to be with you. What about the future? This is the question put by my children. I say that uh, this is. Uh, yesterday. So we've just emerged from COVID and we had to uh, 
accept digitalization, but I think that we've saved seven years because we are a paperless company and we can uh, uh, talk remotely. Uh, COVID might be behind us, but there's a new crisis coming in, inflation. With COVID, we accepted digitalization. With inflation, we'll have to accept innovation. At last, we'll have to change the way we work, the way we manage, the way we uh, trade at the international level. I can tell you that we're witnessing a period whereby we can change everything. So we have to change our cars, we have to change our homes, we have to change the way we build things. And of course, uh, we need to change the way we move. We need to change the way we work. We need to change the way we live. We have uh, to uh, focus on sustainable issues. Where do we need to invest? We need to invest in all kinds of fields because uh, the uh, world uh, of the past will be transformed into the world of uh, tomorrow because we have to change, but it's a pragmatic approach. So uh, I spent uh, 20 years in technology in 5G and uh, we uh, came up with uh, usage innovations. So the free box pro was marketed, we provided uh, some innovation in uh, uh, IA, in data. So uh, on Saturday evening, I'm with my friends and I tell them a, a story and they can't understand what I'm telling them. We don't talk about in artificial intelligence during dinners, but now we have a camp. It's an opportunity. It's a campus for innovation. It's a local project, but uh, the influence area is a uh, Southern Europe and Africa with an extended regional impact. And the idea is to roll out and disseminate know-how and expertise. Of course, uh, we want to be able to grow. We want to be able to invest if we are not knowledgeable. And knowledge, know-how should be made accessible to everybody. We have different backgrounds. We have different careers. But we share the same will. Uh, the world is being transformed today. It's quite hot. Of course, in Aix-en-Provence, in, in, in July, uh, the temperature is uh, quite uh, hot, but uh, in Dunkirk, if it is hot in September, of course, we'll have lots of uh, uh, question marks in our mind. So, of course, transformations are key, but uh, transformations should and be left in the hands of uh, some people. And today, we need to disseminate knowledge, know how, because if you want to reinvest in the world, we have uh, to create added value. Of course, uh, in uh, uh, it is said we need to do that, we should do this, we should do that. We know exactly where we are heading for, but we don't know how, and we don't know with whom. So today, uh, what matters is uh, to consider the camp as a place where private public research associations uh, are intertwined. But we need to go beyond a promise. The plan is called Next Generation. It is reminiscent of a Star Trek. Uh, I'm not Elon Musk, we are French. So uh, we have, uh, we are not Elon Musk, but how can we deploy and roll out quickly our technologies? The camp uh, should be a flagship of French excellence at the international level. We have the researchers, we have the products, we have the ideas, we have the will, but we shouldn't sideline anyone. Intelligence, artificial intelligence uh, enables young people from the uh, suburbs to work in the telecommunications operations, and they are delivering some services. They will be uh, designers in electronics, in mechatronics, in uh, plastic uh, management. The cost of carbon should be uh, impacted on products and services, and there will be lots of products that we will be able to produce locally. So what is at stake? In order to build a plant from scratch, it will take between seven and 10 years. So the person who is digging the foundations, he has uh, 
um, waited for three years to get the administrative authorities, and it will take four years to design the processes in order to uh, open the factory. I'm not going to tell you that it's too long, but as part of the industrial alliances in the current uh, companies that will be redeployed, I think that one hectare, one acre, should be made available for another company. It is faster uh, to produce on a contem on a contaminated land, land uh, than the opposite, and that's an opportunity. We can go further. Let's take the example of the camp, seven acres in nature in a great, magic, magnificent setting. The campus is unbelievable, uh, 12,000 square meters of buildings in nature, amidst nature. So. It, in 2017, you are a superhero if you do that. In 2022, you are a criminal, sir. So it, it is not really fashionable, I mean, to build concrete buildings in nature, among nature, with a great architect who helped us. So what is at stake? We need to fast track the French know-how. And uh, we've been famed for that. French excellence is notorious. There are some international alliances on specific products. Of course, we need to keep our uh, digital sovereignty. We have uh, to decide by ourselves. Uh, let us uh, move ahead. We need to uh, devote means to quantum electronics, calculation, computing, infrastructures. There are things that people don't know. France is the third largest country in terms of data centers. I mean, it was not deliberate. I mean, the uh, nuclear uh, energy was not really expensive. So people created data centers, but it's an asset that we can tap. We can use these basic facilities in order to create tens of thousands of jobs in order to uh, sort out the problems that we are currently contending with. Mr. Ashen uh, what is your take on that? And two questions. Uh, uh, one question from the room. A uh, question for you, Jacques. If you were to uh, pick up an action in order to foster industrial action, is it private? Is it public? And uh, I listen to the different speakers, you have some cultural elements, cultural dimensions, mindset, training, and of course, uh, there's an issue of uh, transformations. I mean, to transform a society of civil servants into a society of innovators. So, uh, there are some constraints with the uh, political authorities. We expect a lot from political decisions. We expect a lot from the state. Maybe there should be more leeway uh, for the uh, private uh, sectors. Uh, they uh, shouldn't uh, wait for the state to act in order to make decisions, uh, to invest, uh, to move ahead. Of course, we're not going to wait for the magic decision made by Paris, by Parliament, by regulations. So I will focus on value. Eight million spare parts are being made, and we have two billion spare parts coming in. In order to reorganize the supply chain, it will it would take years. So the time uh, issue plays a key role. If we are to relocate, I'm not quite sure that it's an objective in itself. We need to have a 10 or 50 year time horizon. These are long processes regarding your uh, question. Of course, we are not waiting for the state to move ahead. And of course, we want the state to leave us in peace. So, uh, 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 you were asked to identify uh, some priorities. You've mentioned uh, four priorities. So, if we were to go further, is something has to be shared with the people in the audience. If you uh, were to deliver a priority message, what would it be? In order to build a factory in plant, so you have to take a decision, then you have to wait for the authorizations, and uh, it will take a lot of years. In China, in Chengyang, when you decide to invest in a company, in a factory, 
80,000 square meters, it will take eight months. And this example is a glaring uh, example. Uh, in France, I mean, there's a lot of red tape, there's a lot of bureaucracy, and we will die uh, from it. The world is moving fast, and the state uh, should deliver some swift authorizations. If you want to get a, a passport, it will take time, uh, weeks. In some countries, you can get a passport in 48 hours. So the administration in France is uh, stifled with fewer professionals. I hope that there aren't too many civil servants in the room. I'm a former civil servant, so that's why. I make that comment, but we've been talking about bureaucracy red tape for quite a long time. We said uh, that uh, constraints have should be uh, lightened. If we don't do that, there will be a risk, there will be a big danger. So it's important to streamline and to simplify the uh, processes. Uh, Nicolas Dubourg, what is your take on that? Uh, the priorities, the supply chains, uh, what is your perception? And uh, the same question uh, that I put to Jacques Achambro, a message that you would like uh, to put out, I mean, for those who are courageous enough uh, to endure the heat, uh, for, for people who are connected, uh, in order to mobilize our mindsets, our, our, our energies, what would you say? Regarding the supply chains, regarding uh, projects designed to create uh, companies, uh, plants and factories in France, in the field of energy, uh, more mobility is required. We need to get uh, some local facilities. There's something that I've noticed uh, we have a lot of red tape, a lot of bureaucracy. You have the Resilience and Climate uh, Act uh, that uh, contains some constraints, but things move ahead when the local politicians uh, uh, provide some help and when you get uh, access to subsidies. The industrial projects are very cumbersome. It's a matter of organization. You need to liaise with suppliers. Access to energy is crucial. The ecosystem should be established very swiftly in order to get uh, those uh, projects up and running. It's uh, crucial for these uh, new and local industries. There's a topic that we haven't uh, talked about. What about the social dimension? So you create jobs in some regions, uh, jobs that are um, that are sorely lacking in these regions. People are happy because they can get jobs. So we need to be fast, and we need to fast track the whole process. Some decisions will have to be made. We need to take on board uh, people. We need to nurture a dialogue with people regarding renewable energies. If you want uh, uh, to create a, a solar farm, and there are many examples in France. Uh, one gigawatt uh, solar park in the land uh, forest. But uh, this uh, farm is uh, very useful because you have a carbon-free economy and uh, you can supply uh, energy uh, to the uh, local areas, but you need uh, uh, to uh, cooperate with the uh, citizens. It's a matter of social acceptance. Of course, uh, there's a need to uh, talk to people. So we are almost done. Uh, Madam, do you want to add something regarding the global supply chain? Had in mind a specific example. Tunisia, my country, depends on wheat uh, from Ukraine. So we uh, depend a lot on uh, Ukrainian wheat, and we have huge surface areas with uh, wheat, but these uh, surface areas are not uh, uh, exploited because the prices are too low. And if you do the maths, uh, uh, farmers uh, can't make a living, so they branch out. Uh, to other uh, uh, crops. Allow me uh, to highlight an example. 
given by Mrs. Lagarde. We want to make sure that local supply sources are closer. Uh, Neassuring the uh, supply sources uh, should be closer, or you can buy uh, products uh, from uh, local uh, people, from local producers. That's very important for the uh, Chinese. Uh, over a period of five years uh, in China, they should relocate some companies in order to get closer to Europe. So the same goes with Morocco. So it means that uh, some companies and factories could be relocated next to Tunisia and the Mediterranean countries. So we are almost uh, done, but uh, we can continue to talk uh, outside. Thank you for being with us. And